Hello there and welcome to my channel. I am picking up this series on Gregorian chant for beginners that I started, a f let's see, two years ago. And um, sorry for the long interlude, um, but I'm picking up where I left off from my last video, which was video number three. This is part four. And so we're getting into reading the actual notation of chant and understanding all the cliffs and the news and how to find what a new chant melody is by using your piano or eventually using your head. So I'm going to be referencing my notes a little bit here and then I'll kind of switch back and forth from my like camera in my hand looking at the handouts so that you guys can see while I'm pointing to things what I'm talking about. So first thing, there is this cool word you need to know. It's solfege. Any idea what that is? You music geeks out there will know this, but for the rest of you, all you need to know is that if you've ever seen The Sound of Music and you heard the doe, a deer, a female deer, ray, a drop of golden sun, that is all about solfege. Solfege is the scale do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. And actually, if you still haven't seen The Sound of Music and you don't know what I'm talking about, um, you can just... <laughs> Just take my word for it. This is a this is a very you know old use musical terminology for the whole steps and the half steps that there are between certain notes, and you can see that all played out on the piano keys. We're going to look at that. It's very visually obvious, so that really helps if you can look at that. Also, there's a book out there called "If You Can Sing Joy to the World, You Can Sing Gregorian Chant," something along those lines, and. Until I came upon that book, I never thought about it. But Joy to the World is a perfect scale. It just goes down. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. So maybe you can sing that with me a couple times. Let's sing the Do, Re, Mi from the bottom up, from Do to Do. And then we'll sing all the way down. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do. Do, Ti, La, So, Fa, Mi, Re, Do. Maybe one more time, just to get it locked in. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do. Do, Ti, La, So, Fa, Mi, Re, Do. You're turning into an expert already. <laughs> Singing the scale backwards really freaked me out when I first heard it. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm just learning this stuff. I'll never be able to do that. But, you know, I didn't even have to think about it after a while, and I was able to just go back down. So the more you work with chant and the names of the notes, the more you'll be able to do that too. It'll just be easy and just like second nature. Okay, so I'm holding the camera. I'll try not to jiggle it too much. This is a page from a handout that I give out at my workshops and to new choir members because it's just kind of a helpful little visual reference of all the different things that go into understanding how to read chant notation, how to find where your notes are and what the melody should be of each new piece as you look at it. So the first thing we're going to look at is um, the do clef. There's two kinds of clefs in chant. There's this one that looks kind of like a little telephone. That's called the do clef. So that is hugging whatever line do is on for that whole piece. And the do clef never moves through a piece of chant. It's always on the same line, the same place. I'm, I'm once in a while, there will be like a, a chant where you sing the whole refrain um, with the do clef in one place, and then for the verse, which the verses are often meant to be soloed or sung by a smaller group, um, sometimes with a more, uh, like a wider range, sometimes they'll move the clef just for the verse. But then when you go back, you'll, you'll be back at the clef. But anyway, so it pretty much doesn't move. Um, that's the do clef, okay, the little telephone. When it has a leg on the back of it, that is called a fa clef. And it just is used instead of the do clef on music sometimes, depending on what range the chant is set in, because sometimes it works better to show you where fa is than do, because obviously do wouldn't even be on the lines. See, it's all the way up there. But if you put the fa clef here, you're like, oh, I still know where I am. So anyway, that is, those are the clefs. Here you can see it over here. Here's another example. They have it over on this other line. So it doesn't matter what line it's on. It's just telling you this line is fa, which means that, you know, down here is mi, down here is re, and underneath that line would be do. 
and you know this line would be down. So anyway, so that that'll help you. All right, so here's the next part of our process. This this is a picture of the piano keys because I find this is just a great visual to help people understand the concept of whole and half steps in music. You can see how apparent this is visually on the piano. It's really cool because you see from C to D is a whole step with the half step in between. From D to E is a whole step with a half step in between. But look, there's no black key here, which means from E to F is a half step. And then from F to G, there's a whole step because there's the half step. From G to A, whole step. A to B, whole step. <gasps> but look, B to C, there's no black key, which means this is the half step. See, the piano moves by half steps. So it goes up, down, up, down, over, up, down, up, down, up, down, over. So that's really cool, and it's the exact same way in chant. That piano comes from just the rules of music and the whole steps and the half steps. So here I put the note names under these keys just to help you because what's really handy about the piano is if you make Do a C, or if you're going off of a Fa clef and you make Fa an F, you will always be able to play a chant where it's written on the white keys only of the piano. Okay? I, I, okay, I, I'm saying only. There is one flat in chant. It can happen on T. And, and it will show the flat sign whenever it's actually flatted. And it doesn't stay flatted for the rest of the piece. It's only for that word or incise, that like bar measure, whichever is smaller, okay? But that's a rule. We'll get to that later. Anyway, um, so T can sometimes be flat, but that's the only one you'd ever use. So that makes it really easy. You can just ignore all the other black keys. So if you always make Do a C or Fa an F, um, on your music, you can plink out whatever chant you are learning just on your white keys. So you just go up, like if your, you know, Do is on, usually, uh, here, like on this one up here. Do clef's up here. So that means this is Do. It's also Do down here. By the time you get down the scale, here you are, there's Do. So if you made that a C, you'd be playing C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And then whatever chant, we're going to look at one in a minute. We're going to look at a, an on you stay, and we're going to apply that so that you can see how that works. But right now, I just want you to look, look at these whole steps and half steps. This is really interesting because um, chant is movable. This kind of freaks out people who have studied modern music theory because chant isn't set in a specific key. It's made to be placed wherever it's comfortable for the human voice that's singing it. And so it's not, it, it's not locked into being on certain notes. Obviously, if you're playing on the piano and just for your own ease of practice, you're making Do a C or Fa an F, you know, that's only for your practice time, just to make sure that you get the, the notes in the right order according to the music. But as soon as you know it, you can pick any note you want to start on and just keep your notes, you know, keep your melody where it's supposed to be. Just like any time you sing a song, if you hear it somewhere or it comes into your head, you just pick a note and start singing it like, Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. But another day you might start it at, Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. It doesn't matter what note you started it on. You kept the intervals of the notes the same. You sang the same melody, but just started it on a different pitch. So chant is really great for that. And um, so all you have to know is where your whole steps and half steps are and learn the melody of the music according to that. And then you'll be able to sing it anywhere, anywhere that's comfortable for your voice or for your choir's voice. Um, and one thing that um, came to me after I'd been singing chant for a while, I was so excited because it used to be that I could only figure out a chant while I was looking at the piano keys. And I was very dependent on, you know, plinking according to the, you know, keeping everything on the white keys so that I would get my intervals right. Because that, you know, that was my security. All of a sudden it was like, I looked at my music in Technicolor and I was like, I can just hum this. I know do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Like, I know how that scale sounds. So then when I was singing, I would look at a piece 
And I would say, oh, there's dough. So I would be like, da, 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 da. I would hum to myself. And then I would hum down to wherever the first note was. And then I would just keep that scale in my head that I had just hummed and where, where the notes were. And I would follow it with the music as the notes went on. And then I was just amazed that I was actually able to do that and keep them right. Also, the more you sing chant, the more you kind of can in anticipate what certain intervals sound like. And so when you see a jump on the music, like a, a third, you know, from one line to the, like, uh, this, if there was a note here and then a note here and here, you just start knowing kind of what that feels like to sing that. So you don't even have to think about it as hard anymore to make sure that you're doing it right because you'll just feel it and it will just come out. So if I haven't explained that well enough as far as chant being movable, um, as long as you keep the notes, you know, the whole steps and the half steps where they are, then that, you know, you can let me know in the comments um, and I will try to address that for you. Um, right now, we're going to look back at our piano keys for a minute at the risk of being um, kind of redundant here. And I just want to go over the note names on the keys. I want to sing this with you a little bit too. But we have here, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. And you see that from T to Do is a half step. From me to fa is a half step. If you can remember that, mi fa ti do, mi fa ti do, that that will really help you because you'll be like always knowing where you're going. And if you're taking too big of a jump, you're gonna end up a little bit off. But anyway, so those are your only half steps. Everything else is a whole step. So from me to fa, from ti to do, that's that's put here. Half step right here, half step right here. Over here, it's just showing you the exact same thing, but just in different clef terms here, because here's your fa clef, so it's showing you, remember, your half steps, do, ti, fa, mi, ti, do, mi, fa. Okay, so here we're taking a break from my diggy little diagram to show you an actual, well, this is a keyboard. I'm sorry, I'm cheating. Okay, so this uh, piano key is on a keyboard. Here we go. We're going to sing the scale a little bit. We're going to go over those steps again um, because a whole scale is made up of eight steps six whole steps and two half steps and that's called an octave because it's made out of eight steps that you go through musically to make an octave so i think i'm gonna sing two octaves with you if i can let's see how high this goes ha <laughs> ha all right here we go we're gonna sing it with the solfege names while we go do re mi so we're gonna do that ready do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Re, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Okay, <laughs> well, you know, you get the idea. That was very squeaky and interesting. But, um, so that, you know, it just keeps going, going down the piano. Um, anyway, so I don't have the names, you know, written on my keys right now, so sorry, that's a little bit throwing. But if you remember always to make Do a C when you're playing on the piano to help you be sure of your part, then that, that will work just fine. So here, for an example, we're going to look at this On You Stay right here. Okay, so if you were just sitting down learning this, sorry, I'm going to move that so you're not seeing that word up there. And then you look and you say, well, what kind of clef do I have? I have a Do clef. There it is. That means there's do. And you go do, ti, la, sol, fa, mi, re, do. Oh, look, this is do too down here under this bottom line. Okay, so if you make this a C, then this would be a D. So here, your chant begins not on do, it begins on re. Re, mi, fa, re, re, do, do, re, re. So you're going to play that on your piano but you're gonna start on D because D would be Ray. If Do is C, then the next note up, and here's the next note up, is Ray, and that's gonna be D on the piano for you. So you're just gonna follow it up in the progression of the notes you see. So we're gonna follow the progression of the notes as we see them on the page. So if they're right above each other, <clears throat> then you just go up one key. If it skips two, like it goes up two spaces, then you're gonna go to up two keys and so on and so forth. So that's how you'll know that you're keeping keeping to the melody as it, it's written on the page. Just as many spaces as your notes are apart, make sure you move that many keys. Mm. On you stay.
if my camera got off my keys a little bit. I've never done this before. It's a little challenging. Anyway, so I hope that was a good illustration of of moving with the music on the keys so you can see how that works. So there was even a flat in there, which is kind of cool. So you got to see that we went day qui tolis. So it's really simple. It's This is just mercifully simple because chant is made for everybody. So it's not supposed to intimidate you. Everybody can do this. Also good to remember, you don't have to depend on the piano forever. The piano is really just helping you get going in the beginning. I mean, if you always want to use it to make sure that you're playing things out, that's fine. But eventually, you're going to get this so in your head, you'll be able to just hum it out. So here I switch to, I, I'm showing you a fog clef, because we haven't done anything with a fog clef yet. And instead of playing on the piano, I'm just going to hum the solfege scale, and I'm going to figure out where these notes are just from humming it. First, we're going to sing the scale together. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. And then we're just going to hum it. So this is what I do when I see a new chant. I see the fa clef and I go, okay. Da, 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 da. That's what I have to do to get to fa. Do, re, mi, fa. And then I'm like, oh, so fa, da, da, da. Da dum da 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 da. So that's how I know what I'm humming because I figured out the scale ahead of time. Let's do that again. So do re mi fa fa clef and and then do gloria in excelsis deo. Or the first line of the song too is here. This is a fa clef as well. So if I'm like fa, let's find fa. Do re mi fa fa mi re do da dum um, da dum. So those are my notes. Da 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 da. That's my first note. Da 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 dum. So that's how I get it. Kind of like oh, there's the first transition. Da 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 da. So let's try that again. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus. And if we were going to do it up here, again, you find the, you just kind of get it in your head. You're like, Do, Re, Mi, Fa. And then you're like, hmm, 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 hmm. There's fa. Dum, da, dum, bum. Gloria in excelsis Deo. And you've got it. All right, so for just a minute here, we're going to talk about when you look at a chant, you're going to see a Roman numeral at the far left of the top. Um, in some newer books, they'll actually replace it with an Arabic numeral. If there's just an Arabic numeral there, then that is just replacing the, the Roman numeral that's telling you what mode the chant is in. So modes are like, there's eight modes in chant. They're sort of like the, the different moods of chant. There's kind of a whole science to the modes and how they emphasize or de-emphasize, you know, different different of the four temperaments and um, depending on which mode you're in that kind of determines like where your chant is set on the scale and what the dominant note is of that chant so if you want to get super geeky about chant you're going to want to get into modes but I honestly haven't had to know any more than that about them to be able to sing any chant I came upon so I just want you to know that like this one's in mode seven then there, you remember there's eight modes. So that's just telling you this is in mode seven. So when you hear it, you're going to be like, oh yeah, after a while of singing chant, you're going to come upon the modes and go, oh, why does it sound so minor? And then you're like, oh, it's in mode four. Or, um, you know, you're just going to, you're going to kind of recognize them. Or you might even find that you kind of like the sound of certain ones because of where they're set on the scale and the way they move, to which note they rotate the most around. It, it gives it quite a distinct feeling. So you'll notice that sometimes during different seasons of the year, like Lent, they'll have the more more of the minor modes, or for the feast days, they'll have more major modes, um, certain tones that they're trying to evoke. And that's how you'll see that marked out with that on the music. So it's something you can watch for. Another thing we're going to talk about are the bars in chant, like um, in modern music, you know, there's measure markings, but they're always like, it's always like a full line. 
between measures and chant. They don't have measures like they don't have time signatures. So it's not like this is in three, four time or this is in six, eight time. Um, they, they don't have that because it's not bound that way. Um, obviously, you'll see all different numbers of notes in phrases. So all you need to know about these measure bars, here's that. This is called a quarter bar, this little one. These are half bars, full bars, and double bars. Oh, I guess there's one up here. Hey, a double bar. Okay. And so the quarter bar, it's kind of like um, if you're feeling weak, you can take a breath here. If you are singing alone, you'll probably want to take a breath at the quarter bars unless you have lungs of steel. Um, but if you're in a choir and you can kind of circulate your breathing with other people kind of in and out, then you can carry through these. You can just ignore them like they're not there. Those are just sort of like breath opportunities. Also, um, half bars you do usually take. Um, I've sung with one choir where the choir director had us sing through the half bars. Um, that That is not typical. Usually you just do break there and you take a breath. So you can make that a rule for yourself unless you're feeling really ambitious. One thing that's interesting to note, uh, I heard a choir one time singing. They tried to carry through every bar they could and it was exhausting listening to them because there was hardly any points of rest in the music. It just went on and on and on. It was almost like I was getting drilled with it. Like they sang the chant well, but there's a reason why the phrases are shorter and longer the way they are. And you're supposed to sort of, you know, you kind of increase your speed and you're getting more dramatic. And then it has the mortise at the end where you're sort of like slowing down, getting ready for the break. And then you pick it up again and it's got these swells, you know? And if you don't have that, then it, it can just be kind of drilling and not as interesting to listen to or as restful to contemplate. So that it's good to observe the bars when you can because they really do give structure to that. And for the sake of the listeners and, you know, the points they're meditating on, it's just really helpful. The monks really knew what they were doing. So full bars now. We've talked about half bars. Those are take a breath. Kind of like a, you know, a, a quick breath and then you just keep going. A full bar is a full stop. So you can stop and take a nice breath, keep going. Um, the double bars, they mark the end of a piece or the end of a section. When you get to a double bar, you can sort of like pause, take a nice breath before you go on, almost like you're doing a musical surprise. Like people listening might think you were done singing and then whoop, you go into the next thing, surprise. So you can give yourself a nice break there just to delineate also that you're moving on to another part of the piece. So quarter bars, um, breathe if you need to, otherwise skip. Half bars, take a breath, kind of a quick breath, move on. Full bars, full stop. Um, decent breath, keep going. Um, double bars, end of a piece or end of a section, full stop, nice break, and then continue or, or not. If it's the end of the piece, you just quit. Um, I feel like I'm going to talk about these later. These little marks here, you'll notice at the end of every line of chant, there's this little like half note. It's like peeking at you. This doesn't get like, it doesn't have a syllable with it. It doesn't get a note value or anything. What this is telling you, it's called an ictus. Oh, are these the ictus marks? I don't know what I'm talking about. No, these are the kustos. Kustos. Okay, kustos tell you then when you go to the next line of music, the, the first note you'll sing on that line of music is it's telling you where it is. So here it showed you it was going to be down here under that first line and sure enough there it was. And then, oh look, it's over here too. It's like, look, guess guess what? Get ready. Your next note's going to be here. These are really helpful. They're kind of weird when you first see them. You're like, um, that's like musical clutter, but it's really smart. Here, this one shows you the next note's going to be, what do you know? That one. Duh. So anyway, those are kustos. Those help you remember keep on track as you're moving along the lines of the music. One thing I should add back to our discussion of modes and numbers of the chant is if you see a Roman numeral and an Arabic number, um, I've discovered that the Arabic number indicates the century in which that chant was written. Cool fun fact. And we are just cruising right along. So while we're at it, I feel like we should just go ahead and talk about nooms. Um, I call them nooms. That's typically how I hear them called. Some people say nooms, but it's perfectly acceptable to say either way. Okay, so nooms. There's that word, nooms. Sorry if this is really small. And you know what? I have pencil drawings on this. Completely ignore my pencil drawings. They mean nothing, okay? Nothing that you need to know. <clears throat> All right, so this is a really handy little... <clears throat> 
um, handout, which, you know, any of these handouts that you see used during these videos, I would happily send you the file. If you want, just leave me a comment down below and <clears throat> I will put my email address in the description so you can email me and <clears throat> I will reply and I'll attach the files that these go in. Okay, so here, here's names. We don't have to remember all these technical names. The point of this sheet and going over it the first time is just to get you acquainted with how the notes move in the different formations, the different nooms, uh, because sometimes that can be a little a little funny to get used to. Okay, so here we're going to look down here. Pumptum or pumpta, you can kind of, um, th that's just the basic, like, it's a note. It's a note in Gregorian chant. We call it a pumptum, all by itself at least. There we go. Podatus, ignore the one. Okay, this just means a bottom so bottom note is sung first. So looks kind of like the telephone, you know? It's like a doe club, but backwards. But it's got the stem on the side to show you. You start on the bottom and you're moving up. Woo, they're connected. So you sing the same two notes, or sometimes there's more than two um, in a in a formation, but you sing it all on the same syllable. So you're just holding that syllable and you're just singing da dum da dum da dum da dum always the bottom first so that's the key there the torculus all notes are of equal value sung consecutively da 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 dum so that's pretty easy but they're just connected to kind of help these these nooms are really cool i just have to say i love square notes and the way that they move it's so good at getting you to render it in a meaningful way when you're singing so much more helpful than just round modern notes which all they do is just by their color you know they let you know how long to hold them but they all look the same so it's, it's kind of sad when you are singing a lot of chant and you have to sing in modern notation you're like oh man and in chant it's all built in right there to the music they don't have to have um crescendos and and all these things written over the music um okay climacus all notes including the small rhombus are of equal value and are sung consecutively. They show these like they're little diamonds coming down, almost like drops of water falling. It's like da 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 da. So that's all. It's all together. These are all notes and of equal value, but they just go down. Next one on the lineup, bistrofa. And here over here, you see tristrofa. It's the same thing. It just has three, three punctum instead. So these are repeated notes sung as a single note of double length. So you're not moving on this one, but th these are fun because you can pulse them when you're singing them. And the point of these is to kind of crescendo while you're singing them. And then when you get to the next note, you just return to your normal volume. So you're like, da da, and then you just go da 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 da. So or da 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 da. So that's kind of fun, and you can just sing them straight while you're counting them, like la one two three, or you can go la 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 and really kind of distinguish them pulse them um, that can add some real interest interest and kind of like texture to what people are hearing when you're singing it so it's not just another like longer note it's like mm -hmm. like it's alive it's it's beating with the the rhythm okay presus repeated notes sung as a single note of double length so sometimes they have like da da dum da da dum so this has a stem, um, one director I had uh, told me that if notes have a stem, it sort of like gives them a little more importance and you can, you can kind of make those notes a little bit louder if you want. So if you're wondering why some of them have stems and some of them don't, um, I'm sure there are multiple reasons, but that's one way to give excitement to the music as you're rendering it to kind of think important when you're singing the notes that have a stem on them. Scandicus, all notes are of equal value, okay? So this is, you know, again, you start at the bottom and you go up and this one has, this one has a little um, tail on it, but this one doesn't. So anyway, here, so da da da, da da da, wait, da da da, da 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 whatever. I'm not singing that right. I'm not singing the intervals right, but I just want you to get the idea that it all flows together and it goes up. Okay. Go down here. Liquescent notes. You'll see these little tiny ones. They're like half size and they kind of have a little bit of a, like a hook point on the end. 
and they are a full note, like they get a full value of their own. But the reason that they're small is because you're supposed to close on whatever consonant or um, vowel sometimes, um, but usually it's a consonant that you're singing on. Like if you're singing a song twos, you'll see them over the N's and the L's sometimes. And so you'd sing it like, Ozana in excelsis. So you can kind of exaggerate it. They don't want those consonants to get lost. Or sometimes it'll be like like a, a T right before a D, and they'll have you closing on the liquescent right on the T, which is kind of awkward, but it's like that way you you heard like in the in one of the chants it goes et D chant et that a T has a because they don't want you to just hear a D chant, like it's all one word. They want you to hear it and know what it's saying. So that's what you would do here. So it has a full value, but it just closes on the consonant or the vowel. Sometimes it yeah, closes on a diphthong like a u ow. So you'd really like emphasize the oo. Sometimes it's um like in the Alleluia's, sometimes they'll have it on on the um on the I coming off the end of it, like Alleluia. And that's really funny. If you're doing it on, in an Alleluia, you say E with your lips like ooh. So put your lips like you're saying ooh and then say E and keep them like that. So it's like E. So that way you hear it, but it's not like louis You know, you don't want to sing, sing about Louis because that's not really what we're doing. Um, but anyway, if that, if that helps at all. That's, so those are liquescents, those little funny guys. Uh, another thing that will come up sometimes Oh, we have these like in the Climacus, you see the the diamonds, um, they're all about the same size as the punctum up here. Or the, uh, anyway, they're about the same size, um, but sometimes you'll see them where the diamonds look tiny, like they look smaller than some of the other diamonds in the music, and you're like, am I seeing this right? Are those tiny diamonds? If you see tiny diamonds, that means that those diamonds are telling you to treat them like a liquescent, so that on the last tiny diamond, you would sing it, you would close on whatever consonant or vowel it's over. So that that's something that you might see too. Um, not all books will even include the tiny diamonds, but the Graduale Romanum, which is like, you know, the staple chant book for the mass, that will, that will have them in there. Um, that'll include the tiny diamonds, so watch for those, because you're not seeing things. They're really, they really are smaller than the other ones. Okay, Virga, they're showing you a punctum with a tail on it. Virga. So those are like Important, look at me, woohoo. Anyway, clevis, higher note sung first when it's like this. See, it's kind of showing you, the stems kind of lead you up, up and down. But on the podatus, you'll see how the, the stem's on the other side because you're always coming at the chant from this direction. So if you see the line on that side, you're going up. And if you see it on this side, you're gonna follow it down. So higher note sung first here, but bottom note sung first here. Porectus, these are interesting. Three notes, the first two at either end of the diagonal. So this is a kind of a swoopy fun thing, and it sounds cool to sing it, but it's, you don't drag your voice, but it kind of gives you that idea when you look at it. So it can come out in your singing even though you don't drag down. So it's da-da-dum, da-dum-dum, Da da dum bum bum bum. So yeah, the first two notes are at either end of the swoopy, um, and there. So that's pretty easy. Tristrofa. We talked about that one in the bistrofa with the pulses. Okay, so the quilisma. This one's kind of interesting. Um, if you can see this, I'll zoom in here. This middle note is a squiggle. It's not just a solid square. Um, it says middle note of a three note group, the note before the squiggle is expressed. Okay, so the idea with these is kind of a building, a building up and like an ascension. You're like da da da. Some directors will really try to have you lengthen all of these notes somewhat, but a little less as you go. But that can be hard to do to keep everybody together. So typically what you'll find is people just lengthen the note before the squiggle. So like da da da. And um, the thing with the squiggle is fun too, because it's squiggly, you can do a voice tremor on it. Uh, like vibrato, you don't sing chant with vibrato. Um, it's just not, 
it's too showy. It's not made for chant. Um, chant's meant to be sung straight and plain. But these notes, you can you can vibrato. Um, you can treble them. Um, so if you can kind of go, like say ha 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 ha, like fast like that. That's kind of what you're doing. Ha 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 ha. I can't always achieve it, but you know you you try, and it does it does come across a little bit. Gives just a little more interest and texture to the the sound of the music. Okay, Sally Coos here. Okay. Throughout um, chant notation, you're going to see these little vertical lines here. Um, when they're in this, like this kind of a note grouping, it's telling you that this note that it's underneath, just this one, is lengthened. So, da da da. Or, how does this one go? Da 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 da. Um, a lot of times in chant, um, they'll have little short horizontal lines over one note or even a few notes they'll have like a long one over and that'll tell you that's they call those episemas and that tells you to lengthen the note like so you'd sing it like one and a half um, but if they don't have anywhere to put that horizontal line they'll put it underneath right here um, and then it's called a solicus this formation with um, with that line underneath so it says the last two notes form a podatus so again bottom to top the note marked with the ictus is lengthened. Okay, um, so if you see the ictus mark, that little line, in this formation it means to lengthen this note, but if you just see this ictus mark on a random note or like uh, on a on a diamond or something, um, that's it's a it's a rhythmic marking for like measuring. Um, the ictus marks are typically used as sort of like, um, I can't, I don't understand them very well. But it's um, not something that uh, that a singer needs to worry about. It's more like the monks writing it to make sure that they're getting the enough beats in the right phrases. So you'll see ictus marks like every every three notes or every you know however many, depending on what chant and how they needed it to sort of measure that flow of the chant. And I I haven't studied those, so I can't really speak to that much more. There's a lot more to know about ictus marks, but. Here, for basic purposes, all you need to know is when you see it like this, it means to lengthen this. And then, when you see an, inter an interval of one-fifth in a solicuse, um, whenever there's a jump of a fifth within a noom like this, you just always lengthen the top. And sometimes they'll mark it with a solicuse, sometimes not. But it, it also sounds, it just kind of sounds right. And if you know this, the chant Ave Maristella, it starts out that way with the jump of a fifth. Ave Maristella. So it starts out like that. Um, but it, it sounds more interesting to go Ave instead of Ave Maristella. Like there's... They're, this is helping to give it structure. So a jump of a fifth gets lengthened. Sometimes they'll show that with an ictus mark up here over the solicus. Okay, then here's some other rules. Oh, I guess I talked about epicemes already, but let's read these anyway. So dotted notes are doubled. A line over or under notes is an epicema. Uh, I, when I say under notes, I'm talking about these, but almost always they're over top of them. Slightly lengthens that note or notes. If it's over more than one note, each one is lengthened slightly less than the one before it. See second solicus note above. Sometimes that top note is not marked with the vertical epicema. Sing it as if there were regardless. We talked about that. The jump of a fifth, you lengthen the top note anyway, even if there isn't a mark. Tiny diamond notes are liquescence. We talked about those already. Half punctum on end of each bar line is acoustos, cue to the first pitch of the next line. So hollow note indicates a reciting tone. Um, sometimes you'll see uh, a punctum, like um, on a psalm tone, like a psalm verse or something. And, and you'll just see like this one note and it's empty inside. And you're like, oh, what does that mean? It means that until you see another note, you just keep singing all the syllables that come on that note and they just didn't want to print a note for every single syllable. So that's kind of handy. Um, anyway, then when T is flat, it becomes T. The flat lasts to the end of that word or incise, whichever comes first. Stemmed notes like virga are important, but don't overemphasize. If you see an italicized vowel, skip it and don't pronounce it if the printed notes don't give you time to. 
so they just they do that sometimes when that's only within the text you'll see that um you'll see that's you like in the veni creator spiritus uh, some versions of that there will be a few verses where there's a word with italicized letter or or an italicized diphthong and you just you, you can't make it fit and keep the meter of the hymn so you just skip that vowel and don't pronounce it and it works um anyway you're not butchering anything that's just they they plan that in to take care of everything so here again is your table of nooms we went over everything so now you know all the notes and all the rhythmic markings that you're going to see when you're looking at a chant and what to do with them and we also i don't know if we've really sung any dotted notes and, and they don't show any here um but i think the dot is usually hmm, let's find one. Oh, look there's some dots Oh, it's, it's to the right of the note. Okay. So that doubles the length. If you see a line over... Oh, look, there's a hollow note. Uh-oh, I went past it. Look, there's one. Ah, ah, ah. It's showing you, or if there's extra syllables, you're going to sing them on that note instead of the one that came before. Okay, that's so handy. Okay. But yeah, here, over here. Oh, look, look, there's some epicema right there. So dot doubles, epicema lengthens. Remember when you get to the end of every phrase where you're going to take a breath and remember to, to follow that, that rule of mortis. Mortis means death. So you're kind of laying it to rest gently and then you pick it up when you start the next phrase over again. Really, that's part of what makes chant so soothing and prayerful is those, those breaks and those, those rests. Thank you for tuning into this video where we went over the musical notation and the nooms and the bars and how to plink out chants and to read them new and to learn to hum the scale in our heads. We covered so many things. Your brain is probably bursting. But give yourself time. You can watch the video again. Reach out to me if you have any questions. And hopefully I didn't make you sick jiggling the camera. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, thank you for bearing with me and tuning into my channel. And I plan to post future videos on the series of Gregorian Chant um, with the rest of my workshop notes from days gone by just so you feel like you get the whole package before it's done. So anyway, stay tuned and check back for more videos. Thank you so much and God bless you.